but it's, yeah, I mean, it's an abstraction. Um, it's bits and computers, um, but we associate it. We use it to exchange things that do come from nature. So if you use something that's unnatural um, and use it to buy and sell things that are natural, then you're going to have a problem if the unnatural part expands exponentially and forces the natural part to expand exponentially too. You've got a problem. Something sacred is something that is... I keep getting asked this and I really should think of a good answer because I have, I kind of know it, but it's hard to articulate. Um, a lot of the words that we use are, are traps, you know. Um, sacred implies that there's something that isn't sacred. Spiritual implies that matter is not spiritual. Um, sacred economy is economy that respects connectedness, relationship, and the uniqueness of each thing. The uniqueness of each relationship, the uniqueness of each person, and the And we have another car. I think that one might be far enough away. Yeah. Sacred economy is an economy in which everybody is an artist and in which everybody's gifts are applied toward a beautiful purpose, a purpose that's beautiful to them. And collectively, we will reorient our thinking to what can we as human beings create that's beautiful to us? Beauty will become the new motivating program and instead of security or survival or domination. But I mean, that's what gifts are, that's what our divine gifts are for. You know, we're supposed to look upon our works and say, that's good. You know, just, just as in the archetypal creation story in Genesis. In the future, career counselors, they won't say, okay, so you have these gifts, how can you use these to make a living? How can you commercialize these? How can you make money from these? The career counselor will say, what would you like to give to the world? What do you do that feels good? And that's, that's an important part because it feels really good, really satisfying to give of our gifts. You know, it's not this struggle against the self where, well, you know, we have this greed and selfishness, you know, and we have to control that in order to live in, in the gift, it's that kind of struggle is becoming obsolete. That's part of the old story too. That's part of the, the war against nature internalized as the war against human nature, the war against pleasure, the war against desire. Actually, these desires and pleasures that seem to be causing so much trouble are substitutes for the things that we really want. One reason that people shop so much and acquire so much is because of this, the loss of this connected self where we've been cut off from nature and cut off from community. And therefore we suffer a deficit of being. We feel alone and alienated and, and it hurts. We're lonely. It hurts just to be. And to assuage this pain from the cutoff of our being, we try to acquire more and more things to enlarge the finite self that we've rendered ourselves into in a vain attempt to recover the infinite self that we had and that we've cut off um, by making ourselves small, by cutting us, ourselves off from the totality of being. I think that there's some misunderstanding in Buddhism of greed. Uh, greed is not a fundamental aspect of human nature. Greed is a consequence of scarcity. If, you're, if, if you and I are living in incredible abundance, such as used to exist here in the Pacific Northwest where we're talking, you know, when 200 years ago, the, the fish were so thick on the water that it looked like you could walk across the rivers. Um, under those conditions, greed is ridiculous. If, if, we're live, if, we're, if we're sitting among piles of apples that have fallen on the, on the ground, you know, it would be ridiculous for me to like gather them all to myself and I'm not going to get my pile when there's other piles sitting all over the place. And yet there are, I know because, yes, because they have a perception of scarcity. Whether or not they live in a reality of scarcity, whether or not they live in a reality of scarcity, they have a perception of scarcity. If you do not have a perception of scarcity, then greed is 
a foreign emotion. What we've done is we've created scarcity. The money system creates artificial scarcity where there need be none. For example, there's nothing more abundant on earth than water. When I was a kid, you never paid for water. Water was abundant. Water has been made scarce by, by many things, but by one thing, it's association with money. Anything that gets associated with money is scarce because money is, as we know it today, is fundamentally scarce because of interest. The amount of money in existence at any time is less than the amount of money that needs to be in existence a year from now to pay the principal and interest on the loans by which money was created to begin with. So money is fundamentally scarce. We're fundamentally in competition. Therefore, greed is inevitable. And therefore, because greed is inevitable as a consequence of our money system, and even more deeply as a consequence of our, of our ideology of self, of separation, we need to fight it. And so all kinds of systems of religion and morality are based on try hard to be nice, try hard to conquer these poisons, this, this I mean, different religions put it in a different way. Calvin, John Calvin taught, spoke of the total depravity of man. Um, the Catholics have original sin. Um, and it goes back to uh, the Zoroast, whatever how you pronounce that, it goes back thousands of years, this concept of good and evil in the world, in the self. This concept is a consequence of, well, agriculture, really. But I'm not going to get too deeply into the to the allegory of the Garden of Eden and getting expelled into the world of labor and toil. Um, but it's um, a, new, a new condition. So yeah, I don't, I don't agree that greed is fundamental to human nature. I think it's an artifact of our ideologies and our money system.